this. So uh, Nathan is going to give his talk. We might be able to have like a five minute uh, break here in between the next three talks. Um, so we'll we'll try to plan that around one of one of the next few talks. So Nathan is one of our physiology modelers. He uh, has his master's from Duke in uh, biomedical engineering, and uh, so yeah, he's just uh, he's been on the team for a couple of years. And he's going to give us a, uh, a nice discussion about uh, multi-trauma physiology. So thank you, Nathan, and uh, go right ahead. All right. Can everyone hear me? Let's see if we can chat. Anyone in the chat? Okay. All right. So as Austin mentioned, uh, my name is Nathan Tatum. I work more on the modeling side of BioGears. So I'm going to be going into some of the models that we use in a multi-trauma simulation and uh, specifically how they can benefit the, the medical training community. All right, there we go. So uh, first I'm going to go over a little bit of a multi-trauma overview and specifically uh, some of the BioGears trauma models and how we implement them. Then I'm going to move into the medical interventions, uh, so some of the different treatment models that BioGears has implemented and that we can use. Uh, what can go wrong with those uh, so that you can differentiate between proper training and uh, incorrect medical care, and then uh, we'll go into a simulation result so that we can see how it's implemented and um, used, and then that'll lead us to our conclusions and how, how it can impact the medical field as a whole. So to start out, multi-trauma is really uh, referred to, refers to anyone subjected to multiple traumatic injuries. This is also commonly referred to as polytrauma in a lot of research. And so this can be everything from hemorrhaging across the body to tension pneumothorax, uh, burns, musculoskeletal injuries, uh, traumatic brain injuries. Most of these we do actually touch on in the BioGears engine. Then uh, some physiological changes that you would see vary not only based on the injury but on patient variability. So like some of our speakers talked about yesterday, you know, having a more healthy initial state of the patient can often lead to a more likely uh, chance of survival different interventions that happen, and that's going to be a big factor in today's talk, is not only the interventions that you implement to try and help the patient, but your time to intervention. So the amount of time between different acts and interventions after the incidents can play a big role in the health of the patient and their likelihood of survival. So in BioGears, today I'm going to focus on two multi-trauma injuries, hemorrhage and tension pneumothorax. I would like to focus on those two specifically um, because the TCCC, so the Tactical Combat and Casualty Care, uh, list these incidents as high priority, and they're actually the most prevalent cause of preventable deaths. So um, our goal is going to be to cover both how the medic seeks to decrease mortality and morbidity of the patient and how BioGears, in order to help that goal, is uh, going to be a physical simulation to act depict a multi-trauma scenario so that we can help train and test what can be done to uh, benefit these scenarios. So for background, uh, as most of you probably know, hemorrhage is bleeding and it can be either internally or externally from a broken blood vessel. And for the BioGears implementation, this basically means that there can be an inadequate blood gas exchange, which can lead to a lot of other problems in the physiology. And Again, this is important because it's the largest cause of combat deaths, and it's easily over 80% based on research. Um, that number is actually pulled from a couple of different operations that have recently been done, specifically OIF and OEF. And then pneumothorax is when air gets trapped in the space between the lungs and chest, and um, that causes a one-way valve effect of respiratory exchange, so it's going to lead to changes in your respiration rate as well as some blood gas exchange problems. And um, this is uh, the, the case in 10 to 15 percent of preventable deaths and is the third most potentially survivable cause of death. Okay. So in BioGears, these are implemented, uh, you saw this image yesterday with our large circuit system to represent a lot of these systems. So a hemorrhage is going to be a circuit pathway with a switch connected to ground, and it's modified to instantiate bleeding. So the resistance will change based on flow rate. This allows the fluid flow 
to increase and decrease uh, based on not only the severity of the hemorrhage initially, but as different interventions are taken to try and reduce it. Uh, it's not an all or nothing because it's not hard coded, so you do have flow values that can change. Same thing with tension in the thorax, so you can actually see on the right side of the image the close-up of our lung model. And so I'm going to focus on a closed tension pneumothorax, which is a traumatic injury causing a sucking chest wound. And uh, that'll be a progressive buildup of air, and that'll happen, again, with a resistor in the compartment, in the lung compartment of our bio ear space. So looking at the inputs for bio gears, uh, again, this is important because patient variability and incidence variability can drastically change the outcome. So we do have our patient input, and a lot of that is going to be patient variability, everything from the common sex, age, height, and weight, so you can actually modify body fat fraction, maximum work rate, and pain susceptibility. And then when you incite a trauma in, uh, event, you can, for our two that we're going to focus on today, hemorrhage and pneumothorax, you can not only specify location, but flow rate, uh, severity for the pneumothorax and the, the type of pneumothorax, because there is open and closed again. Um, so this just goes to show some of the variability that BioGears takes into account and how it can be modified for different training scenarios. So now that we've shown that we uh, can alter a patient and that we've modeled different event states, we're also going to explore the care and treatment. So this is going into the, the second part of the outline that I mentioned before. So starting by looking at the medical, interve the medical interventions, uh, we're going to be looking at a prolonged field care. Combat medics often have limited tools. So some of the substances that they've started carrying are tranexamic acid or TXA, uh, which I'll get into today, Tylenol, uh, whole blood. It's very uncommon that they're going to be carrying around fresh whole blood, which is FWB, uh, which is often required for a proper transfusion. Uh, or, sorry, it's uncommon that they're going to be carrying around SWB, which is stored whole blood, because when you're traveling around on the field, you don't often have access to proper storage requirements. So it's more commonly going to be fresh whole blood, and I'll get into what that means in a couple slides. Then tools, often you'll find transfusion bags, tourniquets, decompression needles. Uh, so despite these tools being available, Specificity and variability can often make decision-making hard on the spot for these combat medics um, because if medics aren't trained on specific physiology, the patient response becomes harder to predict. And what I mean by that is if you're someone first on scene responding, you're often, it's a stressful situation and you don't have much time to respond, so you're, you often want to be responding based off what you see. So if you walk up to someone who has both a tension pneumothorax and a hemorrhage, the first thing you're going to see is the bleeding. And Yes, while well, that is what you want to tend to first, if you don't notice the specific physiology changes of respiration as well as a couple other aspects, you may not notice the tension pneumothorax at all. So by looking at the physiology, you can be more aware of some of the different incidences in the multi-trauma effect rather than just a single trauma. And um, then again, as Austin mentioned yesterday, the way we set up bio gears with our circuit structure removes a lot of the computational cost of modeling and simulation, which makes it beneficial when looking at the training application. So the three that, uh, interventions I would like to focus on for today's talk are going to be the TXA, the transfusion bag, and the decompression needle. So TXA, tranexamic acid, uh, is a substance that controls the bleeding, and uh, it does so by causing inhibition of the fibrin activity in the blood. And it controls bleeding in the TCCC, takes precedence over infusing fluids. So when you first arrive on scene, as I said before, hemorrhage is the first thing you would want to control. And in the clinical practice guidelines, they emphasize that TXA should be given to casualties at risk of hemorrhagic shock as soon as feasible. Uh, again, this is important because TXA does become drastically less effective the longer it takes. Whoa, what just happened? Well, no, it Um, TXA becomes drastically less efficient the longer you, the longer it takes for you to give it after, after the incidence of hemorrhage. So then transfusion, this is an increase in blood volume, can increase blood gas transfer and immune health, helping the patient to survive longer. 
uh, and massively transfused casualties have a high mortality rate, so that's something to be aware of. And as a, so the part I wanted to mention from before is that in austere conditions, fresh whole blood is obtainable via a walking blood bank program. And so this is why the transfusion bag is important, is that in very extreme cases, it's often required to actually get a blood donor on the spot because you don't have the capability of just storing whole blood and carrying it with you. And if improperly done, this can lead to a transfusion reaction. Then as far as needle decompression goes, uh, this is, it's required to decompress any suspected tension pneumothorax. And casualties with multi-trauma showing no pulse or highly decreased respiration should have a bilateral, bilateral needle decompression performed. This is just essentially a way of refilling the lung with air and trying to resume functionality of the lung so that you don't maintain a collapsed lung for a significant amount of time. So as I mentioned before, if a transfusion goes wrong, you can, it can lead to a transfusion reaction, which is any adverse event associated with blood transfer. A hemolytic transfusion reaction is the most common, and this is the result of mismatched blood types. And the blood type on identification tags is occasionally incorrect, up to 4% of the time inaccurate, which means not only are there occasions where you don't have the right type of blood available, but you might have occasions where you think you have the right blood type and you don't. So it leads to a transfusion reaction, which can cause noticeable metabolic and respiratory distress in patients. So if you look at the image, uh, the A route is what would ideally be the case where you have a type A blood donor and uh, type B and a type A patient, which leads to no agglutination. However, if you do have type B blood and a type A donor or a reverse, uh, you're going to lead to agglutinins and agglutinates that match up and cause agglutination of the cell, which leads to hemolysis, and that's what actually causes the distress in the patient is the reaction that kills some of the red blood cells. So now looking specifically at our models and biogears, tranexamic acid is a substance implemented. So for those of you that were able to tune in yesterday and hear uh, Austin and Matt talk about some of our drug models, TXA is simply an implementation into that system. And so we have a substance file for it, and the main sense of validation came from a pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics point of view. So here we have the PK curve, which as you can see, does a fairly good job at matching the clinical data that we were uh, simulating it based off of. And the, the difference in the decay of the curve comes from the fact that BioGears uses a single decay, and tranexamic acid is actually typically a three-phase decay method. But uh, when continuing on with the validation, we found that this had very minimal effect with the long-term effects of TXA, and so it still does a very good job of doing what we want it to do. And that can be seen here when we look at the pharmacodynamics. So we have two different scenarios. The first uh, compared blood loss over 12 hours uh, with two different patients that had moderate hemorrhages. They were comparable scenarios, and as you can see, our bio gears fairly matches the uh, clinical values fairly closely, particularly in the long term. So that is the effects that you'll see of our PK curve there. And then the second is a longer scenario based on the time of survival after dosage. And as you can see, the time of survival does increase with the TXA dosage. As far as transfusion goes, our model is based off of the antigen factors that were added to the whole blood system. And so, as you can see, there is both a compatible transfusion action as well as incompatible. After checking for incompatibility, you will trigger a hemolytic transfusion reaction, which leads to agglutination and ultimately a lot of physiological changes. Uh, it's important to note here that a transfusion reaction is often not fatal, but the treatment is often to just stop transfusion immediately upon noticing. So the longer you continue that transfusion reaction, the more likely it is to lead to long-term effects and ultimately an irreversible state potentially. So with the, bottle, with the model in BioGears for the transfusion reaction specifically, we implemented a predator-prey relationship for agglutination, 
For those that are unfamiliar, that uh, is basically an essentially a nonlinear equation to describe the interaction between uh, different components. So those two components in our system are going to be the donor red blood cells and the patient red blood cells. And with the new whole blood implementation of treating these cells as if they're substances in the body are that we let the substance manager in BioGears essentially distribute the cells appropriately throughout the body based on the injection site. And then each compartment has its own predator-prey relationship based upon the concentration of cells from each type in that specific compartment as well as the uh, chance of interacting based upon the concentrations. So with that, we have three assumptions that we have to make, which are that the surface area of the cells are estimated as cylinders and that it takes four cells to stabilize and cause an agglutination that would create hemolysis. And then we remove those cells and attachments to the cells, such as the different blood gases and glucagen, no, glycogen that's attached. Um, and then also only unlike cells can agglutinate, so obviously you're not going to have two patient cells agglutinating with each other. Um, they're like cells, they get along together. And then looking at the four primary physiological changes that we would expect, we get within very close proximity for all three and we get into a range that we found acceptable for them. So here's where I'm going to spend a little bit of time with agglutination because in order to do the predator-prey relationships, we have to track six different concentrations. So the, the first one I'll point out is probably the most important, which is the top left. In blue, you'll see the patient red blood cells, and in red, you'll see the donor red blood cells. So once you inject the cells, you'll see that you have, at the zero time point, the max concentration of both, which is before any uh, relationship or reaction starts to occur. And then over time, so these are four-hour scenarios, the time is in seconds. Over time, you'll start to see the concentration of both decrease until the donor cells are essentially wiped out. But as those donor cells are wiped out, you see agglutination in the form of double agglutinates, which are one patient cell and one donor cell, and that's the top right. So you'll see a huge spike in those initially, but then those will start to decline because those can react and either become triple agglutinates, which are either two patient cells with one donor cell in between or two donor cells with one patient cell in between. And so you'll see a large spike of those after the double agglutinates start to fizzle out. And then in the bottom right are the stable agglutinates, which are four cells, two of each type. And those go up to a stable point where at that point you start to assume that the reaction is stabilizing and there's no more donor cells. And that's the number that we pull out from the actual system in order to create the reaction and cause all of the downstream physiological effects. And then here we move into the third intervention, which is needle decompression. BioGears incorporates a circuit component to permit airflow. I mentioned this before with the pneumothorax. And then we have an additional component added on that you can see is a resistor to act as our needle decompression. This is important because, as Brett mentioned in our last presentation, that uh, BioGears is not hard-coded and that when you implement the change, you'll see a steady change based upon the severity and implementation. So you'll see dynamic change over time rather than any hard-coded changes. So now we're going to get into the scenarios a little bit and um, talk about how this can be implemented in a from a training perspective. So we took our standard male patient and had the two, uh, the two incidences that I talked before. We have a closed left tension pneumothorax. Uh, then we have a liver hemorrhage and a left arm hemorrhage. And so the possible interventions that we could do, uh, first we're going to look at what happens when you do nothing. If this patient, do they appropriately bleed out and die? Uh, does everything go how we would expect it to? Then two, what happens if we follow clinical practice guidelines? Does everything continue on as planned? Is the patient stabilized? Are we able to get them from the field to a hospital? This is basically if everything goes perfectly right. Then the third is improper care. And this is important from a training perspective because we want to see physiological changes occur from improper care that will help our trainee to notice that, that it's not going exactly how they would expect in order to learn from it and implement proper care. That way, if they're on the field, they can hopefully know what not to do. So here's our timeline for our three different patients. 
uh, the first one being no response, so we just initiate the actions. We expect patient death at some point, uh, just a matter of when, and we're actually going to validate this against a clinical study of how long it takes to die from bleeding out of a certain class hemorrhage. Then the second one is going to be a clinical practice guideline. So we have we initiate our actions. We assume some time till reaction of the, for the medic to get to the patient. We start with hemostatic dressing and a TXA injection in order, yeah, in order to address the hemorrhage because they notice that there's also respiratory distress. They do a needle de decompression. And then once they reach a certain point of uh, blood loss, it is ideal to do a blood transfusion. So at some point, they're going to have to do that to get blood back to the patient. And this is going to be a proper transfusion, so there's going to be no reaction. Then in the third one, you initiate the actions. The patient gets to the site, and the first thing they notice is the chest, so they do needle decompression first. Ultimately, that's not going to kill the patient, but then they do need to address the bleeding, so they do a six-day <laughs> dose. However, maybe they give too little because they're nervous and don't want to overdose the patient. Um, then they, they finally go and they do the blood transfusion, but they realize that the patient's starting to respond uh, not the way they would expect because it's a transfusion reaction. So after 100 milliliters, which is about a fifth of the typical dose, they stop the transfusion. Um, in this case, I, hopefully the patient still lives. At this point, the medic's done a little bit wrong, but does it go? Are they still able to get the patient to a hospital or somewhere where they can get a little bit more proper attention? So th scenario one, here are our results. We look at the exsanguination, exsanguination median time to death is about 1.6 hours. A lot of our biodiversity results come out in seconds, so that would be about 5,760 seconds. And if you look on the right side of the graph at our heart rate, um, it's basically right. So the green is the BioGears patient, and the blue line almost all the way over to the right end of the graph is going to be the median time till death when you look at our hemorrhage. And our patient dies a little bit early, but essentially we're demonstrating the proper protocol, and the patient is dying when we would expect. So now that we know the patient is dying when we would expect, can we properly show training to prevent that? So here are our clinical practice guidelines. So if we look at the clinical practice guidelines, can it, can people see it? I don't know if it's typing. Keep going. Can people see the scenario two slides? There we go. All right. Sorry about that. So when looking at scenario two, we follow clinical practice guidelines. So we have the red line on the graph representing the traumatic incident where we initiate the multi-trauma scenario. Then our green line is where we implement a hemostatic dressing and TXA injection. This is basically just tending to the hemorrhage wound. So you can see on our blood volume graph that once you reach the green line, um, the rate of bleeding does start to slow down, and you start to be able to control that a little bit better. Then right after that, we have our orange line, which is a needle decompression. And so this is important because when you look at the respiration rate graph, you can see that we really are able to control respiration at this point and get our patient closer to a stable state. And then finally, we have our transfusion, which is where we restore blood volume, we restore heart rate to normal, and we're able to get our patient back to a stable state for the remainder of our four-hour scenario, which would be ideally enough time to get them back to a location where you can treat them more efficiently. However, if you ever make medical, medical errors, you're going to see these graphs look a little bit different. The patient still does not die, so that's good. But you have our traumatic incident followed by a needle decompression, so you do see that respiration rate start to stabilize a little bit earlier. Um, but then the TXA injection doesn't quite because it's a low dose, it, it still slows the blood loss, but it's not quite as uh, efficient as our previous scenario. And then our blood transfusion does restore some of the blood back to the patient, but you can see it does start to cause more respiratory and heart rate distress than uh, our past scenario. So with all this being said, um, BioGears can accurately depict physiological responses to multi-trauma events and a variety of interventions. This was covered through our validation terms that I mentioned before and the models. Um, but what the uh, scenarios show us is that there's numerous applications, both in training to help less experienced personnel understand the dynamics of human physiology and the response to both proper and improper care. 
as well as hopefully some future applications and decision making where because we offer faster than real time simulations, this can help determine if an approach, if a specific approach is more or less likely to help a patient on the field. Um, and so I think that covers a lot of what our models try to do. A special thank you goes out to our BioGears team, um, the doctors that have helped with validating these models. Uh, Jonathan Wingate specifically helped a lot with the transfusion reaction and TXA, and our research partners, as well as uh, Patrick and JBC1. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Nathan. That was a great talk. Um, I think really informative, uh, hopefully, for everybody here. Um, and I think it really speaks to what Brett was discussing in terms of what is the difference between a physiology engine and a state machine. And I think he really got at that when he was saying it can be difficult to transition from one state to another. People can get stuck in those states. Whereas uh, here we um, can see that even with improper treatment, you're still progressing the physiology. Um, and so you're not stuck in a state, it's just dependent on, upon what your care provider is doing to the patient. And that patient will progress uh, re uh, as a response to those treatments and interventions. So I think it's a really, this is a great talk to follow up that because it really uh, strikes a nice contrast to a state engine where you might only progress whether you fail or whether you succeed. So the two scenarios that Nathan uh, classified there, but it was good that Nathan put in uh, the other one, which was, okay, improper care, but still care. And you can see that even then, you were still able to save the patient, but they're just kind of in a rougher state. So that was, was a great talk. Thank you, Nathan. Does anybody have any questions for Nathan? Um, specifically, I can unmute people um, if they want to say anything in the chat. Okay. If not, I think we'll move on to uh, the, our next speaker, uh, Stephen White, our lead uh, development engineer, and then we will probably try to take a quick five-minute break and then have our last talk of the day. So uh, really quickly, all of the talks that are presented here will be PDF and available for reference on our GitHub site. Uh, we'll be creating a project for it, and um, in addition, we are recording our session on WebEx, and we will be pulling down that recording and then dividing up the talks and posting those on our YouTube account in the coming weeks. So I'll be sure to send an email to everybody. I'll post the YouTube link in the chat in case people want to go back and review specific talks that they were interested in. It might take us a little while to parse the big movie file down, um, but we should have all the materials present for everybody. All right, so our next talk is going to discuss integrating with BioGears, specifically how-to examples. Um, so the how-tos, I think, are something that we've really expanded over the past um, 
over the past uh, past year or so. So every release has had a few new how-to files that we've developed and created that just kind of show specifically how to integrate with BioGears if you just download the pre-built libraries, kind of how to implement an application in BioGears using C++. So uh, that is something that we've been really focusing on. We think they're important for the community. And um, it used to be that some of our how-tos were fairly simple and just showed how to maybe implement an action and treat an action. But now uh, we have how-tos that show how to dynamically run the engine, hang the engine, ask the engine to do certain things for you, uh, create a treatment uh, command line interface for sepsis. We have a lot of different uh, examples now. So Steven's been working hard on this and he's always thinking about our integrators and, and how we can better serve their needs. So his talk is going to be focusing on how to do that, how to approach developing with BioGears and using our DLL libraries.